When Scott said that we were gonna do a series using video games, I was not as excited as you might expect. See, I work with the kids in Smash, and I knew that my reputation was probably gonna end up taking a hit over this. I'm pretty competitive for the most part, but I've been able to, able to hold my own with the kids mountain biking at Ray's, playing football or basketball in the gym at Lyndhurst. I'm not gonna lie, it helps to have about 50 pounds on most of them when you're playing ball. But see, whenever the students ask me to play video games, usually Fortnite, I decline. I act like I'm too good for video games, but the truth is, I don't play video games with them because I'm terrible at video games. My combination of poor instincts and really slow thumbs has always led to my demise. Now, in my defense, I didn't have a game system growing up. So the only time I got to play was if I went to a friend's house. And every time I did play, it was one miserable fail after another. It didn't matter whether we played Mario Brothers, Contra, Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, or Mortal Kombat. I was awful. My friends, they laughed at first, and they thought it was funny how bad I was, but pretty soon, it just kind of became sad, and then they stopped letting me play, and I just had to watch everybody else. Until that magical day when everything changed. See, I'll never forget the beautiful phrase that altered my video game experience forever. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A, select, start. You've got to enter it quickly at just the right time, but if you do it right, Contra would give you unlimited lives. And see, all of a sudden it didn't matter how bad I was, because I could die and die and die and die and die and die and die, and, die, and it, it didn't matter. I could still beat the game. I didn't care that the cheat code took absolutely all of the challenge out of the game. All that mattered was that I could win. Cheat codes were awesome. So I started looking for cheat codes at every opportunity that I could, any game that I could find. I learned secret finishing moves for Mortal Kombat. I used Rosebud to get rich really quick at the beginning in Sims. I gave my enemies giant heads in Goldeneye, and I would cheat the police like crazy in GTA. Whenever a game got hard, I looked for a cheat code. And see, the funny thing is, there have been so many times in my life where I find myself wishing for a cheat code. I wish I could find some magic combination of buttons that I could press that would make my job more enjoyable, or help my boys to behave better. Or what if there was a cheat code for the never-ending laundry? And see, most of us have felt that way. Because when life starts spiraling out of control, so many of us wish that we could just hit a button or rub a magic lamp that would help us through the most challenging parts of our lives. I mean, so many of us wish that there was a cheat code that would get us out of the financial situation that we're in. Because we overspent and overcharged, and now we find ourselves in a place that we never dreamed we would be. We wish there was a code we could enter to help people who get sick, or a code to help our kids do well in school, a code for our jobs, our health, our families. You see, the truth is we all have areas in our life where everything would be better, would be easier, if we could just punch in a 10-digit code and become invincible. And here's the fascinating part. Did you know that there was a guy in scripture who felt just like us? A guy who would have done anything, punched in any code to get out of the situation that he was in. I mean, this dude went through some of the worst things that you could possibly imagine. His name was Job. Now, we don't really have a lot of background on this guy. All we know is that the Bible tells us that he's from the land of us. Where's us? We don't really know. Maybe the tin lion, the tin man, the, scour the cowardly lion, or the scarecrow could point the way. All right, bad joke, and I ruined it. <laughs> but seriously, 
We don't know where Uz is. We also don't know what time period Job's story happens in, or even what nationality he is. We do know that Job's likely not an Israelite, because Job is not a Hebrew name. But see, many scholars believe this lack of information is actually intentional, that the author doesn't want us to get lost in the details. He wants us to focus on the questions that are raised by Job's suffering, questions that are super common, questions that all of us ask during those seasons of life that make us wish for cheat codes. Questions like, why is there so much pain and suffering? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why doesn't God just fix this, take it all away? In other words, why doesn't God tap in his cheat code and make life better for me? And that's what Job was thinking. Because the Bible tells in Job 1.1 that he was a blameless and upright man. He feared God and shunned evil. Now that's just a Hebrew way of saying, Job's a really good dude. I mean, this is the guy that helped little old ladies cross the street, ate all his veggies, always turned in his library books on time, and read every last word in the terms and conditions section of his iPhone updates. But despite all of this, there was a point in Job's life when his entire world came crashing down. And it all started with a very unusual conversation. Look at what the Bible says in Job 1.8. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You've blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now, stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. Now this is fascinating to me because Satan says, look, the only reason Job is a good guy is because you give him stuff. So take it away. Take the stuff away from him and you'll see what he really thinks of you. But God, God says, not my guy, not Job, Go ahead, have at it. You can take away everything in his life that he loves. We'll see how he responds. And so for the next two chapters, that's exactly what happens. Satan takes everything from Job. He loses his home, his wealth, his land, even his children. And Job... Job is emotionally devastated. But not too long after Job loses everything, three of his friends hear about it and they come to visit him. Now, these guys actually start off doing something really kind and wise. They keep their mouths shut. See, they do something that the Hebrews call sitting shiva. It's when something bad happens to you, the people in your life, they gather close and they make themselves present in your space, but they don't speak. They don't try explaining away what's happened to you. And this is what Job's three friends do at first. They last seven days and nights sitting Shiva, but in the end, like so many of us, they start talking. They begin trying to explain Job's suffering using top-shelf human wisdom and understanding. They basically say to Job, look, we know that God is just. 
And, and we know that everything happens for a reason. So the fact that you're suffering means that there's a reason that God is doing this to you. But Job, he pushes back. He says, that's not true, you guys. Look, I'm not saying that I'm perfect, but I did nothing to deserve this. And Job's friends, they're not buying it. Come on, man, think. There has to be a reason. And their accusations go on for the next 37 chapters. And the funny thing is, we've all been in that situation. Because we've all been in a place when something really bad happens and the people in our life try unsuccessfully to explain it away. See, when you didn't get the promotion that you really wanted, one of your friends said something to you like, well, you know, when God closes a door, he opens a window. And when a family member passed away, some of us have actually had someone say to us, maybe God just needed them more than we do. And when somebody says something like that, it's so frustrating. And that's how Job felt. In fact, he was so annoyed and so frustrated that he basically told his friends, you're wrong. You have no idea what you're talking about, and you're not helping. Just go away. And so Job's friends, they leave. One by one, they walk away. But then, see, the most amazing thing happens because God shows up. And in Job 38, God and Job have one of the most fascinating conversations in all of Scripture. And Job thinks, finally, I'm going to get some answers. But God, he doesn't answer all of Job's questions. Instead, God starts asking Job questions. Questions like, hey, Job, were you around when I shaped the earth? And, and what were you up to when I was putting the constellations together? And, and Joe, while we're at it, can you tell me where storms come from? And, and can you let me know when the next one's going to be here? And the questions went on, 64 of them in total. And the question we have to ask is, why did God do that? Why does he ask Job a bunch of questions instead of giving him the explanation that he really wanted? I mean, why didn't God show up and give Job a cheat code? Well, the reason he didn't do that is because God is trying to give Job something else. God was trying to give Job perspective. See, God's saying, Job, listen, if you can't know all that's going on when it comes to natural things, do you really think that you're going to be able to understand eternal things? See, Job and his friends, they built their wisdom and logic on the assumption that they know enough about this world to analyze and understand God's ways. And God says, hold up. I'm going to tell it to you real. Your understanding as to how and why this world works is minuscule. Mine is infinite. And when you stop to think about it, it's actually pretty arrogant on our part to assume that with our limited perspective and knowledge, that we would be able to see and understand the unlimited perspective of a God who is all-knowing. So now Job, Job has a choice to make. 
See, he can hold fast to his human perspective. He can cling to his, his arrogance, really, and he can demand answers from God as if they were equals. Or he can humble himself and choose faith in the midst of his suffering. And guess what Job chose? He chose faith and humility. He says, in response to God's questions, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. You see, just like Job, every one of us are going to go through challenging situations. And when we do, we have the same choice that Job did to choose faith in the midst of our suffering. And that just means I don't know why I'm going through this, God but I'm going to keep trusting in you. And in Job's story, we find three important lessons about handling our suffering and choosing to keep trusting God. First, continuing to trust God when life goes haywire doesn't mean that God's going to answer all of your questions. You see, Job's story shows us that despite his faith in God, Job never gets any real satisfying answer to the question of why this all happened in the first place. God God never takes Job up on his lap and says, now Job, I know this has been really hard on you, but I want you to understand, I want you to see, your life is going to be an example for millions of people throughout history. God never does that for Job. He never gets any solid answers as to why, but he remained faithful despite his suffering. And through his faithfulness, Job learned the most amazing truths about who God really is. And that leads us to the second lesson that we can learn from Job's story, which is During the worst times in our life, we can learn lessons that we never thought we would. You see, Job didn't really learn that much about who God really was when everything in his life was going great. But when everything went haywire, he learned more than he ever dreamed he would. And the truth is the same for us. Because we don't learn that much when life is good either. But when something in our life erupts, that's the moment when we learn some of the most valuable lessons. A few years ago, my mother-in-law was diagnosed with cancer. She had beaten it before, but it came back. Now, Now you want to talk about why do bad things happen to good people? You want to ask, why are there unanswered questions? But I watched mom live with her diagnosis with such an incredible joy that impacted everyone around her. Doctors, nurses, co-workers, Neighbors, friends, family. People would come to visit her. They'd come to encourage her. And they would leave feeling encouraged. They would say, how do you do that? How do you have so much joy with all that you're going through? What makes you so special? I'm not special, mom would say. I'm not special. But my Jesus, 
My Jesus is special. You see, through everything that happened to her, mom's love for God never wavered. It only grew stronger. And in her final days, she was so calm, so at peace. She had no fear of death because of the way she had experienced God's love in her suffering. And through watching mom live and die, I learned that God's love alone really is enough. No matter what you're going through, But I learned something else as well. Something I think you should know. You see, for mom, for all of us, saying goodbye was unbelievably painful. And the pain, it's still here. I see it every day in my wife's eyes. When Jordan has questions about being a wife and a mother, and her mom's not there to encourage her, to share her wisdom, to just give her a hug and tell her that she's doing an incredible job. See, even when you trust God completely in your circumstances, it doesn't take away the pain that you're experiencing. Throughout Job's story, we see incredible descriptions of all the horrific things that he went through. And even though he trusted God completely, it didn't change the emotional impact that his suffering had on his life. That's why he said in Job 2.10, shall we accept good from God and not trouble? See, Job openly admitted that he was experiencing a level of pain that most of us cannot even imagine. Even though he was faithful, it didn't take away the pain of his experience. And you need to know that even though you're a follower of Jesus, life, it doesn't have a cheat code. You are going to go through difficult times. Look at what Jesus himself said about that in John 16, In this world, you will have trouble. You see, Jesus made it very clear that even though you've given your life to Christ and you've been baptized, there are going to be difficult moments in your life. And that's so hard for us, especially as Americans, because we are so blessed. And when difficult times come, our natural inclination is to ask, why me, God? And God's response, as we see in the story of Job, is why not you? You see, in a broken, damaged world, our faith in God is not a guarantee that we won't experience some of that pain and brokenness. But it is our choice to remain faithful regardless of what we're going through. Because, you see, that's what makes us stand out from the rest of the world. In fact, when you choose to respond to hardship and difficulty in your life differently, you learn the third lesson. How you handle suffering will impact those around you for God's glory. In Job's story, the Bible shows us 
that even Satan's attempts to attack God's people only further God's purposes, God's glory. I mean, think about it. All of Satan's attacks on Job brought about this book that has been an encouragement to tons of people throughout the centuries, right up to this very morning. Do you think that's what Satan had planned? You see, Job didn't get to see all the hope that came from his story, but we do. Job's choice to continue trusting in God despite his circumstances has impacted everyone who hears of his story. And when we choose faithfulness in our own circumstances, the same thing can be true of us. After my mother-in-law passed away, the elementary school where she worked as a reading specialist wanted to dedicate the school library in her memory and honor. They invited a local pastor to come and to do the dedication. Now, I want you to picture this. You're in a public elementary school gymnasium during the school day. All of the students that attend that school are there, and many of their parents have come as well. And a pastor steps up to a microphone, and he says, Kids, do you remember Mrs. Farver? Do you remember how joyful she always was? Do you remember the smile that she always had for you? The encouraging words, the help that she offered when you were struggling? Kids, Mrs. Farver was so sick, so much more sick than many of you realize, but it never showed. She never complained. She was always an encouragement to everyone. Kids, do you know where she got that strength from? That no matter how crummy she was feeling, she always made everyone around her feel better. Kids, Mrs. Farver had a relationship with Jesus Christ. And his love for her strengthened her to live in a way that made a difference to everyone around her. And kids, I want you to know today that you can trust God in the same way that Mrs. Farver did. And he will have a relationship with you in the same way. And he will give you strength. You see, because of mom's faithfulness, the gospel of Christ was shared in a way that children could understand in a place where it probably never would have happened otherwise. Do you see how incredible that is? Mom had a quote that she would read on the days that were really hard to, to keep her motivated, to keep her strong. Don't waste your cancer, it read. Don't waste your cancer. Mom didn't waste hers. She didn't waste it. She didn't ask for it. Nobody would ever ask for something like that. But she chose, in spite of everything that was happening, to allow her suffering to bring her closer to God and to impact the world around her for his glory. And she did this simply by choosing to remain faithful in the midst of her suffering. You see, the truth is we can all apply this to our own lives. Whatever our challenge, whatever our suffering is, don't waste it. Don't waste your fill in the blank. 
Whatever your challenge, your suffering that you're experiencing, you have a choice. You didn't ask for it. You may never know why it's happening. And the pain, the pain may never truly go away. But you don't have to waste it. You can choose to remain faithful in the midst of your circumstances. And when you do, even though your circumstances may not change, you will change. God will draw you close to him. You will learn things that you never imagined you would. And your life, it will impact the world around you for the glory of God. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, I know there are people in our community today that are suffering, Lord, that have unspeakable circumstances that they find themselves in the middle of, Lord. And I just pray, Father, that you would send your spirit to them this morning, God, that they would feel the strength of your presence and that they would choose to continue trusting in you, to remain faithful, Lord. I pray that all of us would make that choice so that our lives can have an impact on the world around us, Lord. And I pray that everyone would know in those moments that they are not alone, that this community is here for them. I pray that, that we would share our burdens with one another and that when people do, that we would listen and not talk and simply encourage them to continue remaining faithful. In your name, Lord. Amen.